All right, welcome everybody to our kickoff uh, journal club meeting for the spring 2022. Uh, we are very, very pleased to have Daniel Hurtado uh, here today. He's an associate professor at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. And uh, before that, uh, he earned his uh, PhD at Caltech and then uh, he has worked a lot on the heart, but more recently he's been doing some work also on the airways. So we're very happy to, to hear about that. Uh, and we're gonna have you know, a lineup of speakers throughout the spring semester. So please uh, look for us on Twitter for how to sign up. This uh, journal club is being hosted by Emma Lejeune, Manuel Rausch, Johannes Blackmeyer, uh, Matthew Bercy and myself. So we're very happy to have a uh, lineup confirmed for the spring every other week, Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. So again, for the kickoff event of the semester, we have Daniel Hurtado, who will talk about his paper on upscaling the porosity behavior of the long parenchyma at final deformation micromechanical model. So please, Daniel, take it away. Thank you, Adrian, and, and thanks to everyone who's watching this uh, talk for being here and to the organizers. Uh, the, this journal club uh, looks to me like a great initiative and I really enjoyed the uh, past sessions. So thank you very much for, for the invitation. So today I'll be talking about this paper that we published in uh, 2020 uh, together with Felipe Concha, who was a master's student at the time. And um, it's gonna be about uh, multi-scale modeling of, of the lung, but before I uh, jump directly into the paper, I just wanted to give you a little motivation uh, for lung biomechanics in general, uh, which is a, a, an area within biomechanics that has been gaining a lot of traction. And I guess if I show you the uh, next slide, you will say, of course, right? And this is what I'm showing here is the number of deaths from COVID-19 uh, during the pandemic, right? And as we can see, I mean, it's increasing again. Unfortunately, it's coming up. That's uh, uh, unfortunately all over the world. And why am I bringing up COVID-19 deaths today is because uh, COVID-19 patients, the critical ones, end up in an intensive care unit and they very likely are gonna be connected to a mechanical ventilator, right? And mechanical ventilation is all about lung biomechanics. So intensive care doctors, when they, uh, they treat one of these patients and use mechanical ventilator as a lifesaver treatment, they deal with the mechanical properties of the lung, the mechanical response, and there is so much uh, variations between patients that it's very hard to actually come up with a set of optimal parameters for mechanical ventilation. So every patient is unique due to the mechanical response to mechanical ventilation, okay? Now, you would think that lung biomechanics is, is sexy today because we have the COVID-19 pandemic, but it really came from much before. I mean, if you look into the, the world's deadliest diseases, of course, heart diseases, cardiovascular diseases are always ranking among the top ones. But if you look into the third and the fourth, and this is from 2016, uh, respiratory diseases are the ones that actually kill a lot of people. In particular, uh, I would like to mention, for example, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, which is a, you know, a chronic disease. Uh, it, there's no cure. You can basically stop it a little bit, but, but they, actually it's treatment, but not cure. And if you look around the world, there are uh, over 250 million cases. Now that may not that number you know may not sound too bad, but I think the bad news is that the number of underdiagnosed people is around seventy percent, right? And this, if you look into the literature, is is exactly due to mechanics. It's very related to mechanics because the way to uh, diagnose COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is by means of spirometry. And spirometry again is very user dependent. It may, very much depends, you know, on how the, the, the readouts of the doctors are, if they're accurate or not, and then it can vary from population to population. So it's not a very precise tool to diagnose diseases. And again, we need more information and we need more tools to, to diagnose diseases. And uh, if this is not enough reasons, you know, these are not enough reasons for getting into lung biomechanics, well, there is another very good reason uh, for at least me as a, a person coming from the multi-scale modeling world is that the lung is a super highly hierarchical system, right? So if you look into the lung, what seems like a continuum here at the organ level the tissue, if you look deep inside, you will see this highly porous structure, which is actually more uh, closer to what we call open foam cell materials, right? So it's not, it's more than porous, it's super porous materials. So it's actually uh, hard to, to tackle with sometimes standard, you know, 
for mechanical theories. And if you look deeper into this uh, porous structure, you will see uh, alveoli, right? And these alveoli are these small units that are connected one with each other. They're actually not isolated. It's, it's a trabecular kind of like trabecular structure, you know, with pores everywhere that allows the uh, air to come in and out and to, to basically to go through permeates through this porous medium, right? And if you look into alveolar walls, you, you continue to see structures, you know, if you continue to see, have this multi-scale um, paradigm where you have fibers, collagen fibers, elastin fibers, and you also have a, a, a matrix, right? A gel matrix that is more of a water-based um, gel, okay? So again, several different scales, you know, uh, that make it very uh, interesting from a multi-scale modeling perspective, not only from the medical, but also the multi-scale modeling perspective. Now, when it comes, when it comes to the structure function relationship in the line, this is also a very fascinating field because uh, if, if you look into the alveoli, many of the chronic diseases, the deadly chronic diseases, such as uh, pulmonary fibrosis and, and pulmonary emphysema are related to changes in the microstructure, okay? And here, you have a, a very nice picture of, uh, well, an, an interpretation, a graphical interpretation of how, uh, what a normal alveolar wall would look like, right? When you have the basal lamina, you have all the uh, collagen fibers, there are also elastin fibers and so on. And then if you look into diseases, actually this microstructure changes. For example, if you go into pulmonary fibrosis, what we see in the alveolar walls is that there's a lot, a lot more cross-linking done by these fibronectins, right? There's a, a, a lot more, uh, for example, the collagen fibers too. And this actually stiffens, you know, the, um, the mechanical behavior of the alveolar wall, okay? At a very, very small scale, right? And if you look into emphysema, which is another, you know, very, very important disease, during emphysema, you have this destruction of the alveolar walls. So basically your alveoli become larger and larger, okay? And this is really bad because alveoli need to be small in order to perform the gas transfer. You need to have a lot of surface inside the lung. So the, the destruction of the alveolar walls or the surface is it's really bad for the pulmonary function. So again, in emphysema, what you do see is that there, there's a lot of degradation of elastin fibers, for example, there's a rupture of the basal lamina and so on. So again, structural components that in fact affect the function as I'm gonna show you next. So again, this is the microscopic version of lung disease. But then if you look into the macroscopic version of the lung disease, there are many tests that are performed on lungs in order to understand the mechanical behavior. One of those tests is the super syringe test or what we call the pressure volume curves, which is basically um, putting air in, in, in several steps into a lung and then measuring what the pressure is at the different steps, right? And so what we see here in this control uh, case, this is a normal lung, you do see what the transpulmonary pressure is, which is uh, imposed here in the trachea, right? And then as you go increasing the pressure step by step, you will start to see what the lung volume is. You can measure that from different systems. And you do these curves that actually tell you a lot about the lung. First of all, it's not an elastic organ. It's actually super inelastic. You do see a lot of hysteresis, okay? Second of all, it's uh, highly nonlinear and we're gonna see that in a minute, right? But also when it comes to uh, respiratory physiology and you talk to clinicians uh, or at least intensive care doctors who know a lot about pulmonary function, they do observe uh, features such as elastins or compliance, which is the inverse of elastins. And it's related exactly to this slope here in this curve, right? So for example, again, this is a volume versus pressure. So it's a, we, we mechanicians are more used to uh, having volume on the X axis probably, or deformation in the X axis and pressure in the Y. So you need to flip this, right? And what you see is basically a certain slope here for this um, sending a, a loading a branch. But then if you look into emphysema, for example, lungs with uh, pulmonary emphysema, what you see is that slope actually is reduced when you look into the elastins or increase if you look it as a compliance, right? So it's basically the lung is more compliant. It can accommodate more air. And the problem, the problem is that it doesn't have enough uh, elastic recoil, but okay. This is um, another story about emphysema. And if you look into pulmonary fibrosis, what you see is the opposite. You do see that the, actually the lung stiffens, right? You need a lot more pressure in order to, to increase a very, very small amount of volume, okay? So again, highly mechanical, and these are parameters that actually doctors use in order to diagnose these diseases, okay? Or at least they try to see or try to use, you know, indirectly from spirometry and so on. So I guess uh, with, this, with, with these two views or perspective from the microscopic and the macroscopic version of, of lung mechanics, uh, what is pretty evident, at least to me, is that connecting microstructural features 
with the whole lung mechanical behavior is critical, really critical to pulmonary medicine. So Manu, you have raised your hand, please. I have a quick question. So this highly nonlinear behavior, is it primarily driven by the material behavior, the constitutive behavior of the lung tissue, or is that a, a structural slash geometric, or is, is it both? It's a, it's a very good question. I would, let me answer you with this. Uh, it's a highly complex system. It's, a, it's not only uh, elasticity of the fibers and so on within the lung, and this is very interesting for the system, you do have a surface effects, right? So basically alveoli are lined with fluid and that fluid is highly hysteretic. So basically it has a highly nonlinear behavior as well. So you need to add the tissue response and on top of, I mean, add to the tissue response, you need to add the, um, the surfactant response. And that also makes the lung very, and also is coupled with the thoracic cage. So basically thoracic cage, when we look at the lung as a whole, is also contributing to this uh, curve. Most of the There's curve. also the complexity of these lobes like sliding on each other and unfolding, right? And, and sort of like relatively shearing. Do these play yeah. into the sort of like global nonlinear response? So that's like all encapsulated here, right? Right, absolutely. Uh, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. I haven't seen any study uh, assessing the impact of sliding, for example, in this response, but you are right. I mean, the, the lung is not just one organ. It actually are three lobes. Right in, in in the in the left in the right uh, lung, and and all, all those low, uh, lobes are lined by this uh, you know uh, tissue that is uh, basically making this uh, slide mechanism taking this slide mechanism. So yeah, you're right. I mean there are again many complexities in the modeling of the of the whole lung as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So again, uh, with this question, you know, so microstructure uh, changes function at, at the large scale uh, level is that we jumped into the paper that we published a couple of years ago, but, and, and well, okay, in this paper, let me first go into what the state of the art is, or was at least at that time. And uh, let me just start with a very old, you know, uh, results. So lung mechanics is something that has been interesting to the community since, and sorry, let me, okay. Has been very interesting to the community. Actually, uh, YC Fang was studying uh, lung tissue strips in his laboratory and was doing the mechanical testing, um, trying to observe what the behavior was. And he immediately, and others, of course, uh, realized that the constitutive response was pretty nonlinear, as you can see here. This is a stretch ratio, and there here's the Lagrangian stress. And you do see the, that has this exponential um, behavior that uh, made Lang very famous you know, for his, his works. Uh, it's also highly hysteretic, maybe not shown in this picture because he, this is an isolated strip, but then when you look into the whole lung behavior, there's a lot of hysteresis, right? And it can also be rate dependent it, it, to a lower degree, but still there's something that you observe. Uh, and so lots of people uh, with, based on this data, experimental data, decided to go uh, around the constitutive modeling of the lung using standard hyperelastic theory. So they propose strain energy models like the funk exponential model, the Mooney railing, for example, also uh, polynomial Mooney railing, Glasgow, in order to incorporate uh, the volumetric component, which in the case of the lung, and this is interesting to mention here, the lung is a highly compressible solid, right? In contrast to what we typically see in biomechanics when we're doing cardiac mechanics or vessel mechanics, the lung is actually very compressible, okay? And it's important to be so, otherwise we wouldn't be able to breathe. Right, so uh, so this models like black suko, for example, which are uh, initially proposed for porous materials, they actually work well for this kind of um, experiments, right? So the models are able to reproduce in the actual tensile tests. Of course, they are a fit to this data, so they, they should you, they better reproduce it because if, otherwise they won't be published. But an isotropy is assumed, which is something again a big question: uh, is the lung parenchyma really isotropic? Well, this was completely assumed; it hasn't been really tested by anyone, but never validated again. But the big problem with phenomenological models is that there is no direct connection with microstructural parameters. So there's always the question around, is there, are these models really predictive? I mean, they're useful, of course, you can implement them in commercial codes if you like, uh, very uh, quick and fast to be sold, but are these predictive, right? Okay, so a second generation, I would say, of constitutive models uh, were those based on microstructural considerations. And when it comes to the lung, what, what you can find in the literature is that some of the microstructural models are, um, are idealizations of the alveolar arrangement, like the one that we see here, where you take a unitary cell, 
which in this case is a polyhedron that repeats a polyhedron that repeats all over the place, and that you discretize uh, the geometry using, for example, finite element um, simulations. Okay, so it's basically the the concept of coming up with the what we call the representative volume element, right? That we can model and then running a finite element simulation, and then once once you have that simulation, you can average the stresses, you can average the strains, for example, what well, this strain driven you average the stresses, the strain will be an input, right? And with that, you can get a constituent response at the tissue level, okay? Now, this RV, as I mentioned, can be idealized, which is this regular geometry that I'm showing on the top figure, but it can also come from micro computer tomography images of the lungs. And this is something that uh, also provides a lot of information and is more, it's closer to a realistic geometry, right? So you can do both. Uh, you, again, you solve a microscopic problem, in the computer, and then you compute a volume average of the stresses, and that's the input to a larger, larger scale model, right? And the advantage of these models is that they uh, they typically are much more predictive than phenomenological models because they incorporate these microstructural features. Microstructure is directly addressed in these models, okay? And if you look into the literature, we'll find that uh, this kind of models have been used to predict the uh, both the elastic and also the inelastic response. Uh, always in the nonlinear regime. So it's always uh, thought to be a model for finite deformations. Uh, I would say that linear models for the lungs are really, really bad because the lung really deforms a lot. It's one of the organs that deforms the most in our body. So, uh, so linearized uh, theories never work here, okay? But of course, these models, when you solve a finite element square type of simulation, if you wanna go to the full lung, are extremely, extremely demanding in terms of computing time, right? So this is uh, one of the big, drawbacks, I would say. And, uh, and they also, if, if you want to be predictive, you do need microcity information, right? Which is something that may be available for some species. For example, in, in our lab, we're working with, with rats and we take uh, rat lungs and we put them into microcity machine and then we get all the images and so on. But then if you want to go into the human lungs, for example, maybe a different situation. It's not as easy as to, uh, as to get you know, the whole lung from a rat and, and fix it in, and put it into a micro CT, right? I mean, and in addition, you may have uh, one condition of these images, right? That have fixed dimensions, but then what happens if they're in different conditions, for example, a disease condition with different kinds of disease and so on. So again, to get this um, geometrical information may not be also easy, right? Which prevents the, the use of this massification, I would say, of this kind of models. And again, uh, the validation is always very important for these considered models, and, and in this case, um, models based on RVs um, have been validated predominantly for isotropic or inflation conditions. So basically you take the lung and you put some uh, pressure everywhere the same, you know, and you see how this um, basically changes volume, quantify that uh, the volume change and then compare to experimental uh, PV curves, for example. That's predominantly how they have been validated, okay? Now, in addition, there's one more thing that is not uh, written here in the screen, but it's also that the models that I've been showing you, they're mostly strain uh, driven or pressure driven. And this comes from the fact that when we do mechanical testing is typically we impose the deformation and we measure force or we do the opposite, right? We, we, we impose force uh, and then we measure deformation. But when it comes to the lung, it's actually a poor elastic medium, right? It's not just about the deformation of the tissue, but it's also the interaction of the gas in this case that's gonna be inside of alveoli with the surrounding alveolar tissue, okay? So these models are, I mean, if you wanna go into poor elasticity, these are not purely strain driven or, or, or pressure driven, but they're both, okay? So this is also an important point. And from that perspective, very, there are very, very few models that, uh, that consider these two phases within the solid. So having all that in mind, they said, we ask ourselves, uh, can we develop a predictive and computationally effective, effective model of the lung tissue that accounts for these microstructural features and evolution. And that also incorporates not only the, um, the tissue, the alveolar tissue response, but also the interaction with the, with the gas in the airspace of the alveoli. Okay, so in order to do so, what we uh, resorted to was uh, a, the two scale finite deformation homogenization theory. Uh, this can be highly mathematical. It, the, the theory itself is, um, it's not new, actually it was been, has been proposed uh, since a long time, particularly for linearized elasticity. I would say for finite elasticity, finite deformation elasticity is a more recent developments for this, right? 
But again, it's a, it's a theory that's been mostly used for soil mechanics, for example, or other areas of, the, of mechanics, polymers, other materials, but not so much for biomechanics and, and biological tissues. So we thought it was an interesting opportunity. So what we do in, um, in two-scale homogenization theory is that we start by saying, okay, I have this medium that if you look into the smaller scale, you will have oscillations very quickly, I mean, quick oscillations occurring in the microstructure, right? So I can think of the domain here as a omega chi, where chi is a very small parameter that is telling you there's a microstructure here embedded, right? That we call the composed domain. Of course, since we're uh, working with a porous medium, we're gonna have a solid region, which I uh, denote by omega xs here, and also a fluid or gas region that I call uh, x, uh, omega xf, okay? And these two are complements. Basically, I'm not assuming that if there, there's only, in this model, there are only gonna be two phases. There's gonna be this, the gas or fluid, I thought of uh, thinking of the gas as a fluid and the solid, okay? And the two of them, they, they basically make up for the whole domain. Now there's some, some term, terminology here. Uh, so the large X and small X are gonna be uh, core scale coordinates. And this is gonna be important. If those of you that have been working on multi-scale uh, theories know that there, you typically have a, a fine scale problem or a micro, microscopic problem. And then you also have a core scale or macroscopic problem. And we distinguish between the coordinates between in one, in one problem or the other, okay? And uh, with respect to the core scale, of course, we define also a homogenized domain where we say, okay, we don't see any perturbations, variations. We just see an homogeneous continuum here, right? But the properties of that continuum are going to be driven by the microstructure, which can be porous in this case, okay? And when it comes to the fine scale, we're going to, uh, we're going to be thinking of a unit cell, or you can think of, yeah, RV I mean, is, is also another word for it, but it's really the uh, unit cell with this microscopic domain that you assume that is repeated infinitely, right? It's a... Uh, basically a periodic uh, array of this microstructure where you can also have a fine scale domain omega y and, and then, I'm sorry, theta y, and then you have the solid part and the fluid part, the noted by these splitters, okay? Okay, so all, all the details, of course, are in the paper, but I just wanted to say that uh, the full problem, right, thinking of all this microstructure together with, you know, the big lang, which is denoted by this chi uh, superscript, it can be posed as follows. So you have here the mechanical balance equation, which is occurring in the solid domain. You have here a constitutive relation, again, hyperelastic, which is occurring in the solid domain. You do have kinematics. Uh, so there is this um, uh, relation between the displacement field and the deformation gradient tensor. And for the fluid, in the fluid domain, you uh, enforce, uh, again, linear uh, conservation of linear momentum, right? Which is basically this equation here. Please note that I'm, the, I'm neglecting uh, inertial terms. Right, and you also have a um, the continuity equation here. So basically, mass conservation given by this in the fluid phase of this um, porous medium, and of course, uh, to this you will add some uh, boundary conditions that are shown here in this list. So you have many boundary conditions. So to scale homogenization theory, what does it says? Okay, so we do have this small scale and large scale. How about we separate the scales and we do a what we call a Cartesian product, right? So we say, okay, let's do a Cartesian product. Let's have a large scale, small scale, and then by asymptote expansion, let's collect those terms that actually are at the same level or scale, okay? And when you do so, you come up with this asymptotic expansion, you make it equal to zero, and you basically get equations for the first order and second order of the asymptotic expansion. And those terms need to be zero since the, uh, the, um, the parameter T takes um, arbitrary variables, values and tend to, to, it's like an epsilon tending to zero. It's basically, you make it smaller and smaller, right? You take a limited Daniel, process. Can yes? I ask you a quick question? Yeah. In the previous slides, and I've always wondered about this, and I'd like to pretend that I know the answer, but I don't. Um, how does this fundamentally differ from biphasic theory? Because it, it kind of looks very similar, right? And I've always, I primarily am familiar with biphasic theory that like Gerard and Jeff use in, in FE Bio, et cetera. How does mm -hmm. this fundamentally differ? I think biphasic theory, you can recover biphasic theory from, from this formulation. Biphasic uh, theory basically tells you that you're gonna solve the fine scale problem just by averaging by the volume fraction. And then you mm -hmm. come up with very simple estimates for, for the material properties, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically, oh, okay, so it's the volume fraction times the uh, junk modulus for the first material times 
plus the, the, the volume fraction, right? But that's a very simple approach really to multi-scale modeling, right? Because you're saying there's the interaction is purely volumetric if you want, mm -hmm. right? There's not gonna be close interaction between, there's not gonna be microstructure, for example. There's no anisotropy, you know, in your, in your microscopic domain. So and then, does, theory, yeah. Yeah. and then how does pluralistic theory differ from biphasic theory? I think, uh, I think it's the same when, when, when it comes to having a, a, an elastic solid interacting with a fluid. What I understand is, is exactly spore, spore elasticity. Maybe biphasic, if, oh, oh, okay. So you, you mean maybe it's a fluid in different phases fa or something like that? Well, that I mean, maybe, I'm not yeah. an expert on either, right? But I'm looking at the governing equations here and they very much look like all the derivations of biphasic theory, but you're right. I guess biphasic theory then usually goes farther and incorporates um, some degree of homogenization. While I guess you do that like in discrete steps. Um, mm -hmm. Corinne, you're on the call, right? Um, do, do you know the answer to this by any chance? Having trained in Jeff's lab now? Sorry if I put you on the spot. No problem. Uh, I, I don't know that I have a short answer. So maybe drop it in the chat and I'll, I'll see if I can put something That's intelligent there. Sorry for interrupting. Thanks, Daniel. Yep, no problem. But again, mixture theory, which is what we know in, in elasticity, right? Or for elasticity, it's a consequence of this. Uh, I mean, you, you can recover mixture theory uh, from, from two scale homogenization, for sure. Mm -hmm. Great, great questions. Right, so we, again, collected terms, you end up with this uh, two problems. Uh, there is this uh, core scale problem, which uh, reads as follows. So given certain um, constitutive relation, right? between the, uh, the macroscopic deformation gradient tensor and uh, parameters for the permeability, the, then you need to find a displacement field or deformation mapping field at the core scale and also an alveolar pressure field, again, at the core scale, right? These two are unknown fields, such that the mechanical balance equation and here is the three C's uh, porous equation, so their C's equation, the equivalent to their C's equation hold, okay? In the whole domain. And again, this is the homogenized domain. You know, I'm thinking here of the whole length, right? And of course, you complement this with boundary conditions that are pretty standard for the mechanical equations. So it's basically described uh, displacement, for example, but also the prescribed tractions here on certain boundaries. But then you need to add to this also boundary conditions to the uh, flow problem. So to, to the porous flow problem, which are pressure at the boundary and or gradients of pressure, which is equivalent to the, to the uh, flux, right? by means of Darcy's law. And, and the, uh, the connection here with the, with the microscopic scale, at least the way we have formulated it, is that the, the constitutive relationship here, again, the, the piola kirk of stress at the large scale uh, is in fact a average, a volumetric average of the small scale, right? Now the question is how do you recover, how do you solve for this small, small scale stress sensor, all right? And this is in fact the uh, fine scale formulation, right? So you need to solve for every point in your domain, a fine scale problem that reads as follows. So given a certain macroscopic deformation and a macroscopic value for the alveolar pressure, then you need to find a displacement field within the unit cell. You need also to define that, right? which is here, such that you have this, again, this is um, equilibrium here, constitutive relations for the microscopic tissue, in this case, the alveolar tissue, certain kinematic relations and the input, in fact, the deformation gradient at the core scale comes here. It's gonna be a boundary condition, right? For the displacement field coming from, I mean, that you need to um, solve in this equation. And of course, this is subject to more restrictions. So in the first place, we, we, we said that the unit cells needed to be periodic. So basically you replicate them infinitely around one. So basically you will have periodic boundary conditions on this unit cell. You need to comply to certain compatibility conditions here. And you may also have, um, I'm sorry, and, and within the unit, so, um, the unit cell, you're gonna have a surface that's gonna be interacting with the fluid, right? So you need to comply with the attraction balance in the surface that is inside the unit cell, okay? And this actually gives you this, uh, this equation here on this surface that is uh, the, the, the theta YSF is actually the, the, the boundary between the solid and the fluid inside the unit cell, okay? 
All right, so now the question is, uh, how do we, I mean, how do we go around this fine scale uh, problem, right? I mean, the large scale problem, actually you may say, well, this is exactly what we have been doing for many years in poroelasticity, and that's exactly right. But now the question comes, how do I create um, a, a framework to predict what the stress tensor response is gonna be, right? And how do I basically, and that's basically solving the fine scale problem. So to summarize, this uh, two-scale finite deformation homogenization is, is nothing but you have a core scale, you input the deformation gradient that you have in the core scale to a fine scale problem, you solve this fine scale problem that's going to give you a stress field distribution at the fine scale, you integrate that, and that gives you the response to this deformation, okay? So this is, again, pretty standard. Now, when it comes to the lung, uh, the first thing that we need to decide is uh, what's going to be our unit cell, okay? And this is very interesting. Funk in 1988, he was already studying the lung and he realized uh, taking by this, taking these micrographs, you know, and, and histological uh, cuts and so on, he realized that the geometry of alveoli were very much polygons. I mean, hexahedrons or, well, I mean, poly, poly, polyhedron in general, right? But he studied very much the geometry and realized that a tetrachaidecahedron, which is this structure here, was the one that better fitted this microstructure that he observed, okay? I don't think he did it in quantitative terms. It's, it was mostly qualitative terms, you know? <laughs> he was not measuring the exact fit and, or misfit, for example, for this. But it's actually uh, a, a very nice um, polyhedron to use to represent the other life. So we decided to take this and to construct a structural model, which is what, what's come next. It's basically made of truss elements that are connected and they're gonna represent the edges of this tetrachidecahedron, okay? So by doing so, the, um, the hyper elasticity problem at the fine scale can be reduced to a structural problem, okay? Like nonlinear structures, which is much more simple. And if you do so, basically you can show that there are only uh, four parameters that you need to take to, you need to care about, right? The first one is the Lame constant, okay? Of the alveolar tissue in this case. So we're going into the, where again, we are the unit cells. We're talking about alveoli. You need to account for the porosity which is basically the gas fraction, if you wish, within the unit cell. And you also have this rotational coefficient and septum overlap that uh, what they do is to um, give you information on how to construct this structure here, this phase of the tetrachidecahedron and the elements, okay? All right, so only four parameters, again, for, for this model. As I said, if you take the, the fine scale problem, it looks very ugly, right? It's a boundary value problem. You need to come up with uh, expensive final simulations. Sure, you can do that. But then there's something very nice that we uh, went through was that if you formulate this from a variational standpoint, so you basically said, okay, I'm gonna treat this as a, as a uh, minimization of potential energy, right? Because it's a hyper elastic solid, so you can do so, right? You end up with this minimization of energy, but moreover, if you make an answer of on how the deformation is going to happen in these uh, edges of the tetrachidecahedron, and then you assume that that deformation is going to be linear within two nodes, you transform this problem into a structural problem with, I mean, much much smaller, much simpler structural nonlinear structural problem. Okay, and this is exactly what we did, and so we we show in the paper that uh, this um, basically end, ends up being a minimax formulation, right? where you have this strain energy that is associated to the deformation of the elements of this uh, unit cell that I'm showing here in blue, right? The, TK, the reduced TKD, we call that. And it's going to, uh, we needed to add for stability um, reasons, we needed to add also springs, rotational springs between these two truss elements, because otherwise it was going to be a mechanism. And there's also some external work that is being done by the alveolar pressure on the surface of these uh, trusses, right? This is how we actually incorporate pressure into the model of the other pressure, okay? Now, there are many interesting uh, things here. First of all, we also make some assumptions, made some assumptions on the symmetry, on the symmetry of deformation in general. So we consider that deformation can only occur in principal axis, for example, and that actually allows you to take only a reduced section of the tetrachidecahedron and not the whole tetrachidecahedron, okay? Uh, again, these are limitations, but at the same time, they actually uh, allow you to, um, to go faster around the model. And uh, we also note that um, in, in solving this, you can locally solve for the parameters L and P, which are related to the compressibility of the alveolar tissue, right? So you add this incompressi uh, incompressibility condition to the structure, but then you can solve it locally 
pretty much like uh, you would do in Huashisu formulations, lower, lower order elements formulations, right? So you can basically condense that. And in the end, for one of these uh, unit cells, you end up with what we call an effective minimization problem, right? That only had three degrees of freedom and has as input the deformation gradient here and the alveolar pressure applied to a certain point, right? So with three degrees of freedom, it's a highly nonlinear, I can uh, potentially, if you like, function here, but it only has a, you know, three basically uh, variables that you need to solve for in this minimization, right? So again, I, you immediately see that this formulation gives you something that is, uh, is more uh, simple in terms of geometry. So it may not be as um, intricate as the micro CT geometries that we saw, but it's very simple and therefore you can solve it very quickly, okay? And, uh, and then once you solve the minimization problem, then you have the forces in all the trusses and then you can compute what the, um, you can average those forces, integrate those forces, average those forces, and then you can compute the macroscopic um, Cauchy stress tensor, okay? All right, good. So how do we validate this model? And this was the question that we were asking ourselves. And uh, one way to do so was to run representative volume element simulations. So basically what we did is we, uh, we uh, fixed some red lines at uh, 20 centimeters of HO2 of alveolar pressure, right? So we, we knew how much alveolar pressure we were inputting. Uh, then we took this to a micro computer tomography, tomography facility that we have at uh, Universidad Católica. And we acquire images of the whole length. And these images are very, uh, are incredible because you can see all the, from the airways down to the, really to the asini and alveoli, right? So it's a very high resolution. It takes like four hours to get one of those scans. Uh, so we could achieve a five micron isotropic resolution for these images. You have you a question. contrast agents for these images? No, we didn't. No, we just fixed them with formal, formally high solution and then took it to the micro city. And then from these images, then we constructed a uh, fine element meshes of representative volume elements. And we were very careful to select representative volume elements that had the same porosity, right? Because we wanted to compare, to have an ensemble of uh, RVEs that basically had the same uh, properties. And uh, these were generated, there were around 3,000 um, elements, right? And the available words for these simulations uh, were considered to be incompressible new hooking models with the same LAME parameter that we would use in the TKD micromechanical model. So we perform all these simulations. It took us like 12 hours to perform each simulation. So a long time uh, we used, uh, for this one, we use Phoenix. I think for, for previous paper, we use Abacus. But again, 12 hours, long time. And then we needed to calibrate two parameters because uh, if you think about the four parameters that I just mentioned, the alveolar wall elasticity is something that has been published or reported in the literature. So we took that value, okay? The porosity is something that comes with the, with the images. So if you have a whole line, you can compute the porosity. So again, that's given, right? It's prescribed if you want. So we have uh, these two outstanding parameters, alpha and D, that we needed to solve for, right? And with, what we, we decided to do is, okay, let's do one loading. Let's, let's basically take the RVEs, compute one particular loading, which in this case was gonna be an isotropic stretching. Let's get those curves. And, if, and then do a fit in order to obtain alpha and D, okay? And this Remind alpha, us, what do alpha and D control? Alpha is the rotational stiffness that basically uh, basically prevented you from having instabilities in the TKD. And D is an overlap. Basically, you have two trusses coming in. So you have an overlap between the two trusses. It's a parameter that basically tells you reduce this amount of volume, okay? All right, so this is it, but, but we consider only one case for the calibration, this is important. And then we consider other seven cases for the validation, right? This is again, you train with one, you, you validate on seven of them, right? Or you test on seven of them in, in, in machine learning uh, parlance, right? And which is exactly what I just said here. But we also consider different levels of pressure, right? I mean, we're, we're here formulating a poor elastic model, so we wanted to see different levels of pressure. So, and the results are the following, so again, I'm showing in, in, in this uh, image, it's uh, stretch versus uh, Cauchy stresses here on the y-axis for uh, different cases. This is gonna be an isotropic stretch, which means uh, I do have a ratio of the stretches that is one to 1.3 to 1.7, if I remember correctly, right? So it's gonna be completely an isotropic stretching condition. And this is gonna be at, at, uh, at an alveolar pressure of zero, kilopascals, and in this case, it's gonna be 0 0.4 kilopascals, okay? So it's gonna be at different um, levels of alveolar pressure. 
And again, this is a training set, if you would like. So we, we took this curves in order to fit the alpha and D, but all the re remaining uh, plots that I'm showing here are predictions and are really predictions of the model, okay? So if you look into this, okay, of course it looks well. I mean, the solid line is the, the TKD model and the, the shaded lines are um, the RVE simulations, yeah? So for different uh, here, um, for the three different axes, right? And if you look into this uh, 0 0.4 uh, kilopascals of alveolar pressure, actually the, the predictions are pretty good. Here we have the uniaxial stretch again, predictions. We look very, very good as well. And if you look into the biaxial stretch um, loading condition, right? You also see that actually the model, I mean, estimates pretty well, you know, the response. And the, here's the um, isotropic stretch. Basically all three directions are stretched at the same rate. Okay. And again, we do have very good predictions. Adrian. Yeah, um, I don't know if you'll address this later on, but what is the variability? Because for these RVE models, uh, if you were, were to take a different uh, cube to generate your finite element model, you would get maybe a different response. So have you quantified the variability from the micro CTs? Right, well, that's, that's a great question. Very, very great question. Yes, there is variability. And this is something that you see here in the data, for example. Now we haven't, yeah, if you think, uh, if you're thinking of uncertainty quantification, for example, we, we haven't done that. I mean, we haven't really quantified in quantitative terms, you know, the, the variance or, 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 or the distribution, right? It's something we could do. I mean, you need to think that each of these RVs, it takes like 12 hours to run. And, uh, but again, to construct the RVs, it's, a, it's very, you know, it takes a long, long time. So basically you need to go to the image, select, you know, make the mesh, everything. So. It's a long, lengthy process, but yeah, it's it's a, it's a good uh, question. Yeah, something we could do. Thank you. So again, and and what we see again, or what we conclude from these results is that uh, our TKD model, the macromechanical model, is pretty predictive for different states of deformation. It's not just for isotropic, you know, uh, deformation or for the anisotropic deformation um, example that we took for, for to fit the parameters, right? Now the microstructural evolution is captured. You can see that both the fine element simulations and the TKD model, they, they show this um, softening you know, curve that you see here, right? And uh, these are extremely, I mean, the micromechanical model is, is extremely cheap computational, computationally speaking, right? And in fact, the speed apps are 10 to the five. So basically one takes you 12 hours, the other one takes you a few seconds, right? So from that perspective, I mean, it's really, I mean, there's no question about it. These micromechanical models, they really, really give you very efficient way to do large scale simulations, right? But something that actually was very interesting also is that the micromechanical model was very stable to solve, right? You have only three variables, you know, uh, it's an optimization problem very quickly to solve. But then when it comes to the RVs and you are probably have suffer all this, you know, uh, sometimes it gets unstable, particularly if you have this trabecular geometry where some parts of it may, may get unstable, right? They get instabilities and so on. So they actually fail. It's very hard, you need to come up with continuation methods and so on. So in fact, if you looked into this uh, curves here, some of the curves stopped before getting to the maximum level. And that was because the TKD simulation, I mean, sorry, the RVE simulation didn't convert, okay? So it was much more stable to work with a mechanical model. We also quantify a little bit of the, um, of the, I mean, we did a sensitivity analysis, you know, a very simple one. And we said, okay, with this, what, what are the most, uh, effective, the most important parameters, right? And if you, so we, we run for different combinations and what we realize is that the alveolar wall elasticity drives pretty much the response of these uh, curves here, right? But also the porosity is very, has a big impact in, in the constitutive response in basically in, flex, in make it, making the response more flexible as you increase the porosity, right? So again, uh, alveolar elasticity, stiffer walls, you know, make the tissue uh, response stiffer. And then uh, higher porosity means more air, less tissue, makes the response softer. Okay, good. So uh, again, and and but but I guess the this is expected, I would say, right? But the interesting part here is that relay is re completely related to 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 pulmonary uh, physiology, right, or to pulmonary pathology, because uh, in fact pulmonary fibrosis is all about stiffening the alveolar wall elasticity. So alve alveoli or alveolar walls they start to get this uh, overexpression of collagen fibers and collagen fibers are gonna make this wall stiffer and stiffer. And this is exactly being represented by increasing this value of mu. So we do recover this uh, pulmonary fibrosis scheme, right? Where, I mean, the mu is increased and the 
the whole length, or in this case, the tissue response is increased, right? And again, in porosity also uh, basically reminds us of pulmonary emphysema. If you have more air, if your porosity increases, that means you have less tissue per unit volume, you're basically destroying alveolar walls, right? So you are to expect a softer response. And this is exactly what we see here as you increase the porosity, you do get a softer response, okay? And again, these two parameters turn out to be the most relevant in the predictions, right? But the nice thing of the work is that they're actually, you, you can determine them experimentally. You don't need to, to, to fit them you know, from, from simulations or come up with some guesstimations and so on. These are actually parameters that you measure from experiments, okay? Either images or uniaxial experiments. So here's a sport alert. I'm actually almost running out of time. Uh, of course, we have integrated this into finite element simulations of the whole length, and this is uh, ongoing work. What I can tell you is, of course, it's, uh, it's uh, challenging because um, you need to implement the, the, the whole TKD model. You, to put it into quadrature points and so on, the integration takes a long time, but it can be done. And what I'm showing you here is, uh, again, a discretization of a whole lung. You do see what the domains are. And then here's uh, an inflation of the lung. So we're applying pressure and we're seeing how the lung responds, right? In increases the volume. Here you see a, uh, the Jacobian field. So how local deformation takes place during the simulations. And we are also trying to validate this with experimental results of a lung that is being subject to pressures. Uh, kind of like a uh, pressure volume curve. But in this case, you have to rem uh, remember that these models are hyperelastic, so they're not included in elastic effects, right? So we're only gonna get, for example, one of the branches. So having said that, uh, I'm just uh, closing my talk um, and I would love to highlight and remark you, biomechanics is key in pulmonary medicine. So please, we need more people in the lung biomechanics community. It's a really cool, cool. And I think there's so much to do. I mean, this is just amazing. It's so much to do in lung biomechanics. So um, it's an open invitation to everyone. Again, multi-scale portal mechanics really is a promising framework for this kind of simulations. And I think this is a nice combination of advanced homogenization theory, nonlinear theory with practical applications in pulmonary medicine. So this is really exciting, at least to me. The TKD micromechanical model turned out to be pretty predictive and effective when it comes to continuity modeling of the lung tissue. And of course we have some future set, which is, okay, if we're going into whole lung, we need to construct the models first, make it you know, efficient, but then we need to also validate it with some information that comes from experiments or it could come from uh, patients uh, connected to mechanical ventilation, right? And future steps, I would say a bit farther away is uh, applications of the virtual lungs due to mechanical ventilation management. So make, really making it a, a useful tool for clinicians to improve their clinical outcomes, okay? And use this also for disease, disease diagnosis or medical device design. All right, so with that, uh, sorry, I, I overwent a little bit of the 40 minutes, but uh, I, I thank you all and I'm happy to take questions. Very much, Daniel, very good. Well, we interrupted you several times, so um, I'll open up for questions from, from the audience. Let me see if I can. Do you want us to raise hands? Uh, well, go ahead and, and, and ask. Yeah, I was going to monitor the, the raising hands, but yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so this is very exciting and it's completely over my head. I, I study biology from a different perspective, uh, but it's wonderful. When I go to make this shape. <laughs> nice. Okay. I go. find that it's not, uh, I had to, this is a rolled up shirt that I put into a ball so that it would stay together. It, it's, it's unstable as itself. Hmm. Um, and so I'm wondering if in terms of multi-scale modeling, maybe what you found is, I wonder, something that manifests in this shape at this scale, but at a uh, perhaps is comprised of smaller structures with a stable shape, like an icosahedron. <clears throat> yeah, that's, well, that's a very good question. I think, and I, I like very much what you have in your hands. Uh, that is a, a truss model or truss structure, right? And mm -hmm. the problem with trusses is that they only transfer axial forces. And if yeah. you're only transferring axial forces, right? And if you don't have, a, perhaps, for example, tetrahedral geometries, these are not going to be stable. It's basically going to turn into a mechanism. It's very easy for, for this, you know, to deform without or with very little energy, 
And that was in fact, uh, one of the problems that we had in the beginning with this TKD formulation, because we thought, okay, let's go with trust elements. And then once we implemented it, it didn't work. And it didn't work and it didn't converge basically because it was not a structure, it was really a mechanism. So that's where the rotational stiffness component comes into, into play, right? We needed to add this energetic term that quantify the angle between these two edges of the tetrachaedecahedron, right? And again, this is an idealization. Of course, I mean, alveoli are tissue. Of course, they're gonna have yeah. some rotational stiffness, right? This is not gonna be just a, a simple structure, but that was the, uh, the, the workaround that we found to continue with this very simple formulation. Because so, they need they need the movement as well as the stiffness. Is that correct? They need both. Exactly. They need both. I mean, they, they need to be able to to extend or to deform axially. But of course, if you don't put any spring, this is going to be a, an unsta unstable mechanism, right? You can move anywhere. So, and the other thing I wondered when you talked about mixtures and you talked about fluid and solid, mm -hmm. what about like soft matter qualities where? At the meso scale level, there are organizational structures that emerge, hmm. you know, in response to forces, which then are relinquished. Um, in other words, rather than a mix of liquid and solid, uh, a, a material which can phase change. Hmm. Phase change. Yeah. Good question. Uh, no, we 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 started from a a simpler, I would say, perspective. So the material is not changing here. So it's not, these are not dynamic properties, right? Dynamic mechanical properties are, we're not considering, for example, growth and remodeling in these models, which would be very interesting to see, right? And you have- so You have to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but again, there's so few works in this field, you know, when it comes to line mechanics, I mean, most people use phenomenological models. They don't even care about the microstructure, right? So if you look, if you really study the literature, there are few, few uh, works uh, that propose a microstructure and work around a microstructure, right? But what you say is, is extremely important, Susan, because uh, for example, when it comes to lung injury, lung injury is all about inflammation, right? And if you have inflammation, you need to work around dynamic properties, you know, or basically water content and changes in the lung tissue. So of course, this is a very important point, but, but again, we are still in the infancy of multi-scan modeling of lung tissue. This was very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice questions. Thanks for the questions. Any other uh, questions from the audience? If you are ready to go, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Otherwise, if you raise your hand, I'm monitoring the- Manuel Roach. At the, at the this. Yes, Manuel. I have one little facetious question, but before I want to compliment you, you're really fantastic. I love it a lot, um, which my questions hopefully indicated. So here's the question. You obviously validated it against these like very sophisticated RVE simulations, and I 100% trust that your model captures the mechanics. But I'm wondering, have you done sort of a negative control where you've seen like how simple can you actually make an approach to still capture that behavior, right? Very good question. And I've, I've gotten this question before, right? It's, you're basically saying, can you use another polyhedra or a, another you know, structure and would you get the same response, right? That is one. And the other one is if you wanted to predict the sort of like total lung um, deformation, right? What would happen if you just chose a neo hooking mom, right? Have you mm -hmm. done that simulation? I'm just curious. Hopefully yes. it would completely fail, but I'm curious whether it in fact would. <laughs> sure. Um, what happens if you take a completely neo hooking model? Um, well, you, don't, you, won't, you won't get the, the right pulmonary function, right? Again, as, as we discussed in the beginning, it's, it's such a complex interaction between not only the solid, right? But also the gas and the interface. The surface, you know, the surfactant acting on the alveolar uh, surface, it, it really impacts the mechanical uh, behavior of the whole lung. It's very important. So, uh, so it's, it's a good question, Manu. No, no, we, we haven't tried other uh, unit cells, for example, which is uh, something that we, we, we should try. Maybe, maybe we're getting the same response with a much simpler you know, unit cell. That's for sure, that's open, I haven't tried that. And uh, yeah, and again, th th these are guests are our first steps into it. You know, we're, we're trying to simplify as, as much as we can because uh, it's really complex. When it comes to the lung also, um, I mean, we're working on whole lung simulations. We're working on simulations, dynamic simulations of the lungs, trying to, to mimic mechanical ventilation. 
But there's so many interactions of the lung, right? There is a mediastinum. They actually, the lung interacts with the heart, with the aorta, right? It's, it's, it's a very tight interaction. It interacts with the thoracic cage. But again, if you ask, start adding all these elements, it makes the analysis very, very cumbersome. So uh, we're taking one step at a time. Appreciate it, dude. Really, really nice work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks again to the speaker for the wonderful talk. And if there's more questions, if people want to stick around after the official end of the of the session, then please uh, stick around. I don't know if Daniel has another commitment, but otherwise, uh, just to stick to the so I guess the official journal club, I will close it, close the official one. Uh, but yeah, if people if people want to continue asking questions please feel free to stick around. Just one last thing, in two weeks, we have our next speaker, which I forgot what the next speaker is, but please check our, uh, our tweets. Well, thank you.